right. Well, last week we talked about worship, and I said that we needed a power to live on, and that's how God gave us the purpose of worship, to exalt Him, to express to Him how worthy He is of our praise. And when a person doesn't have a personal relationship with God, when they enter into our worship service like they have this morning, like you're here this morning, if it's true worship, If it's worship that exalts God, worship that is authentic and spirit-led, then unchurched people get a glimpse of the power of the body, worshiping together. And that's been my experience, that when that happens, they'll be drawn back to discover more about the God that we worship. And when we strategically and purposely take those special times in our year, like Christmas Eve and Easter and even Mother's Day, when we see the community gathered together with us, And when they observe our genuine and passionate worship, it's like pouring water onto a parched field. Their dry hearts will get a taste of the living water flowing through us and wanting more. And maybe not the next Sunday, but when circumstances or people bring them back here, they will find God. And today I want you to know that God has provided others to walk with us in life. I want you to feel at the end of the service that since you have a family to do life with, that you are grateful. And if you don't have a church family to do life with, who is going to walk with you when the yogurt hits the fan? Today I want you to commit to being a contributor, a participant in this church family, and not just a consumer. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, uh, pardon me, it's, it says, in, actually it's Ephesians chapter 2, we are, God, we are members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Now let me ask you a question. Can a newborn baby survive without the help of others? Yes or no? Of course not. You would blow the whistle if we discovered that they were all by themselves. Can a child eligible for kindergarten learn without the help of a teacher? No way. A baby needs parents, A kindergartner needs students. A kindergarten student needs a teacher. And we need relationships. You and I were born and made for relationships. Why? Well, in your notes, God has given us the church as a spiritual family for our own benefit. Today, I want to focus on last week we had a power to live on. This week, we have people to live with. Why now do we need that? Well, because of life's problems. How many of you have ever had a problem in your life? Put up your hand. All right, we all have. Now, according to Solomon, now who is Solomon? King Solomon, the wisest man in history other than Jesus, wrote a book called Ecclesiastes with many insightful lessons. He addressed the real issue about relationships. And he had a few over his lifetime, if you know the story of Solomon. That's another whole message all by itself. So why do I need people to live with? Why do you need people to live with? First of all, because of loneliness. We need people to live with because if we're alone, we don't have anyone to share their life with or our life with. Listen to this quote. Loneliness has been termed the most desolate word in the English language. It is no respecter of age, race, economic status, or intelligence. Albert Einstein said, it is strange to be known so universally and yet to be so lonely. Ecclesiastes 4.8 says, Here is a man who lives alone, who has no son, no brother. What a picture of loneliness. In a study published in January of this year in the Harvard Magazine, it was entitled, The Loneliness Pandemic, The Psychology of Social Costs of Isolation in Everyday Life. It said this, Loneliness was rising even before the pandemic. He says, modern progress has brought unprecedented advantages that make us easier for us to be technically connected. But often these advantages create unforeseen challenges that make us feel more alone and disconnected, end of quote. Friends, social pain is a real sensation for us, and it's just as real as physical pain. Researchers have shown that loneliness and rejection activates the same parts of the brain as physical pain. 
Loneliness affects us all at some point in our lives. Relocating to a new area, losing a loved one, starting a course at college, all are key times when people feel lonely. And research suggests that this experience of loneliness is useful to us as it motivates us to reconnect with others, to seek out new friendships, to reduce the social pain that we feel. But for some, when reconnection is not easy or not possible, if a person is socially isolated, people can remain in this uncomfortable loneliness for a number of years. Reports vary, but the typical numbers of people experiencing loneliness in a prolonged way range from 3 to 30%. Friends, God gave us people to live with to overcome loneliness. The second one is restlessness. There's no real satisfaction in life. When I know what I'm created to do and fulfilling my purpose, then I can stay at the helm longer. I can overcome obstacles. But when I don't see the reason why I'm doing something, I will lose interest and start looking around for something meaningful to do with my time. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 4.8, look what he says, yet he is always working, never satisfied with the wealth he has. When all you're doing is working and you don't have time to be with people, life gets pretty boring. God gave each of us an inner desire to be more, to have more, and to experience more. And life is so much better when you have people to share it with. You see, God gave us people to live with to overcome restlessness. There's one more, purposelessness. Don't ask me to say it again. No reason to enjoy life. In a survey done in 2018, seven out of 10 people you work alongside are what we call in HR industry the walking dead. They're disengaged, or in other words, they're living without a purpose. They don't have God and they don't know why they're here. They're too dis, and pardon me friends, but the greatest two days in your life are the day where you were born and the day you discovered why you were born. Listen to Solomon, again, in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 8. For whom is he working so hard and denying himself any pleasure? This is useless too and a miserable way to live. Friends, I know some miserable people. Put up your hand if you know any miserable people in your life. Put up your other hand if you're sitting. No, no, okay, we won't do it. God gave us people to live with to overcome purposelessness. God knew what you and I would need in life And he created an organism called the church. So let's look at the church family today. And and friends, just hear my heart on this. Many of us believe, but very few of us belong. How do I know that? I've watched enough people move from this church to this church. To this church to this church. Why? Because they got upset because something didn't happen they didn't like. There was no sense of belonging. They believed Jesus, yes. Are they saved? Yes. But do they belong to someone? Only temporarily. It's really important that we find a church family that we can do life with. So look at, God created the church family as an antidote for life's problems. And so today we're going to talk about fellowship. Two years after I retired from ministry and started my business career, I got a phone call from the former general, former general manager of the golf club that I was a member at. We had struck up a good friendship over the years, and out of the blue, in the middle of the winter, when all the members are scattering, and we typically don't see anybody until the beginning of spring, you know, who passed away and who, I got this call, and he asked if I would officiate at his daughter's funeral. I quickly consented and met with the family and presided at one of the largest funerals in my old church that I was at. It was a beautiful celebration of her life. It was tragic how she died. And when I was driving back home, I thought to myself again, how do people do this that don't have a church family? How do they go through stuff like this all by themselves without the support of a local church? You see, I'm so thankful to God that I had a church family who walked with me as I struggled through life's deepest, darkest valleys. And I know that Cheryl feels the same way. We never had to walk alone. And friends, there were lonely days. What comfort me, what comfort we both had was that we had a family who cared for us, not just a physical family, but a spiritual family. But Bob, I don't, I don't think I need this. I can follow Christ all by myself. We'll understand this truth this morning. 
The Bible is very clear that, that following Jesus is not just a matter of believing, it is also belonging. What is fellowship? Warm, fuzzy feelings you get when you, you're close to someone? Someone defined closeness as a feeling you feel you're feeling when you feel the feeling a feeling. <laughs> Charles Colson in his book, The Body, about the, about the Body of Christ, said this about fellowship. Biblical fellowship involves serious commitment and obligations. And as the church expanded out of Jerusalem, this concept of one fellowship with one another and with God bound them in unity and became the very essence of the church's character and power. You see, the Christian life is more than just a commitment to Christ. It involves a commitment to other Christians. Now, let me give you an example of this in Scripture because I want you to see this. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, he was talking to the Christians in Macedonia. They understood this. Look what he says. First, they gave themselves to the Lord, and then by God's will, they gave themselves to us as well. Joining the membership of a church is a natural next step once you become a child of God. You become a Christian by committing your life to Christ, but you become a church member by committing yourself to a specific group of believers. The first decision gets you salvation. The second one gets you fellowship. Now, people, I, I've done enough membership classes, and you know, where does it tell me in the Bible that I should be a member? Well, there's no specific verse that says you shall be a member. But think about it for a moment with me. When Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, first and second, what did he write, who did he write it to? The church at Corinth. When he wrote the book of Romans, who was he writing it to? The church at Rome. The book of Galatians to the church at Galatia. The book of Thessalonians, the people at Thessalonica. There was a local church that people were involved with. So what are the benefits of being part of a church? Glad you asked this morning. The first one is this, that we get to do, we get to have a people to share your life with. If you have no family close by, know this today, you have family here if you wish to share your life with us. So how does this happen? All right, in your notes. Number one, you are adopted into the family of God. When you and I accept Christ into our life and become a part of the worldwide body of believers, we are now part of a holy church. I've met with people from all over the world, and when we discover that we're mutual Christians, that we're Christ followers, there's a bond that can only come through the Holy Spirit. I've stood before a church, before church leaders in Cuba, and I have brothers and sisters in Cuba. I've led a deeper life conference at Novi Sad in Serbia, and I discovered a whole new family there of brothers and sisters in Serbia. I was appointed as a, as a ministry partner in Europe, and for many years I led and cared for and provided spiritual leadership and pastoral care to brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, it's important to understand this, and yet God has given us people right here where we can call him family. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says this, he has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's very own family. The good news is that anybody who is a nobody before Christ, once they know Christ, has everybody who is in Christ as a family member. Remember we used to sing that some of you old timers, because I'm one of those. We used to sing a song called, I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God. Remember that one? Some of you youngsters might remember that if it was ever sung. Why were we singing that song? Because now I have a family. I have a people of like-mindedness, people I can count on to help me and guide me, a place where I can reach my full potential. I can encourage and care for each other. Secondly, you're baptized to, a, to identify with Christ and his body. <laughs> I have to tell you a story. My very first baptism when I was in ministry, 
kind of like Liam, well, he's, he's already had a baptism, but I, I had not done it yet, and we were without a pastor. No, we, were, we had another pastor, but we, at the same time, had a Chinese church that met on Sunday afternoons in our church. And they were connected to the Queen's University, and so they were all a bunch of young people. It was great. I'd never been there, but I, I had spoken a couple of times, but they asked me to come, come and baptize a few of their members. Well, I didn't have an internship where they showed me how to do a baptism. So I get into the tub, and I, you know, I get into the tub like this, and, and I'm thinking, I've got four of them lined up, so I've got one in the tank, and no one told me that people float. <laughs> so I went down like this, and he didn't go. So I pulled him back up, and I went, this is not working. And so literally, I pushed so hard, I put him down to the bottom of the floor in the tank. And then I pulled him up, and he was sputting and spewing all over the place. But it was just, you know, no one teaches you how to do that. So now I make sure that people know how to baptize people. Because that's a very significant thing. When I was, in, when I was over in Turkey and visiting some of the older churches, you know, the churches like that were in four or 500 A.D., the baptismal fonts that they had were very significant. You went in one way, you were baptized, and you went out the other way. New life. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. Friends, if you haven't been baptized, one of the first things you need to do to belong to the family of God is to identify with Christ, and thus you will identify with God's family. Maybe you're here today and you've never done that. I encourage you to do it. Come and talk to us. Why is baptism so important? To warrant inclusion into Christ's great commission? Because it is because, I believe it's because it symbolizes one of the purposes of the church, and that's fellowship. That's identification with the body of Christ. You see, baptism is not only a symbol of salvation, it's a symbol of fellowship. It not only symbolizes my new life in Christ, it visualizes, visualizes a person's incorporation into the body of Christ. It says to the world, this person is one of us. Write this down in your notes, friends. It's not in there, so write this down. Baptism is a physical picture of a spiritual truth. Baptism is a physical picture of a spiritual truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 said this, some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Baptism doesn't make you a member of God's family. Only faith in Christ does that. But baptism shows that you are part of God's family. It's like a wedding ring. It's a visible reminder of an inward commitment that you made in your heart to your spouse. It's an act of initiation, not something you should just put off until you're spiritually mature. When I was over in Israel, we were standing outside the steps of, of the temple. You know, we'd been near the gate, and the, the gate that you would go through to go into the temple during Jesus' day, and the gate was all closed off. And we were there, and our guard described to us the events of the day of Pentecost where Peter preached, and 3,000 people were saved at once. And the Bible says in verse 41 of Acts, those who believed what Peter said were baptized, added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. And Mark said to us, how did they do that? How could they baptize so many people near this spot? Well, we guessed, and then he played with our minds a little bit, and then he said, turn around, what do you see? And below, and remember, if, I, if you remember the series of messages I did on Psalm 23, I talked about living water, the mikvah many baptismal tanks that the Jews would use for ceremonial washing to purify themselves for worship. It's interesting that God is a God of details, and I love that. But listen to what this verse in Acts teaches us. In the New Testament, people were baptized as soon as they believed. At Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized the same day they accepted Jesus. The Philippian jailer who was keeping Paul and Silas in jail when he was saved, he and his family were baptized that night. You see, baptism is an initiation into the, into the Christian life, not the culmination of the, of the Christian life. 
whenever we have another baptism, if you hear the little voice in your mind saying, you believe, follow me and do this, then respond to it. Don't hesitate. Because before you know it, you will have 15 different reasons why you should wait. You should just run to the tank. And what we've done before in terms of membership and before what we did in terms of baptism and all the things that you had to do, Board of Elders and I have decided, and the staff, it's a 15-minute conversation. Not a three-hour theological dissertation. It's that simple, folks. Before I get off on another tangent. Number three, you're committed to others through the Spirit of God. We have a common bond, regardless of our age, regardless of our race, regardless of our, our location. Look what it says, and, and uh, we had this read for us this morning, Acts chapter 4, 31 and 32. While they were praying, the place where they were meeting trembled and shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and the whole congregation of believers was ignited as one, one heart and one mind. What a joy it was to lead in our Vision Town Hall meeting yesterday. The outcome of our deliberations will echo this verse that we've just read. One heart and one mind. In God's family, we get a people to share our life with. And secondly, we get a purpose to give our life to. Man, this is such a sad statement, but I have to read it anyway. 54% of pet owners would choose their pet as a companion over any other human if stranded on a deserted island. What a sad statement about relationships. But I know this about, and one of the things, see my my daughter down in the States, she, her and her husband raised many Aussie dogs. And Cheryl sent me a picture today of three puppies. Pray with me that none of them come home. <laughs> they're the cutest. They're cute, but they grow up. But what I know about dogs, and I've had a couple, is that they have the ability to love unconditionally, right? When you come home, they don't sit back and go, well, I wonder what kind of day he's had or she's had. What do they do? They, just, they come and they'll lick you to pieces. Every time. Our new vision, inspiring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That is a clear vision and purpose that we can get behind. Why do we need a church family to live with? Number one, we can get a greater return for our efforts. When we work together on a common goal, whether that be doing something in the spring to help other people or bringing food to our food bank, The more we do it, the better and the greater the impact that we can have. When each one of us brings our tithes to the church, we have the resources to pursue and to reach our vision. Look what it says. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Ecclesiastes. The second thing is we can be restored from our errors. How many of you today would be honest enough to say to me and to God, remember we're in church, that you've messed up once this morning. Of course. God did not design the church, and this is going to sting a little bit. God did not design the church to point at your faults, but to provide a place where faults could be covered in love and forgiveness. Now, for some of you, that's a little bit of a change. Amen? Amen? Ecclesiastes 4, verse 10. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who has no one to help him up. Listen, friends. God in his perfection knew that we would not live in perfection, but in imperfection. God created the church to accommodate broken people who are living with other broken people to reach other broken people. Listen to this. God desires for us to pick up one another and not put each other down. When I was first starting out in ministry, we 
we're encouraged to get into these accountability groups. I hated them. <laughs> I mean, I did and I didn't, because I, I, I've got great friends who were a part of that that brought great, they were just great refreshment into my life. But you know, we had these questions that we'd always go through, and the last one was, did you lie about anything in the first five? I don't know if we did or not. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not involved in an accountability group anymore. You know why? I've got an encouragement group now. I've got an inner circle who come around me and pray with me and encourage me and lift up my hands. And they don't point their fingers at me. You see, here's what I know about a group. Maybe you experienced this in your triad, because uh, in fact, I had a conversation about, you know, when do we become an accountable, accountability group at a triad? I said, don't do that. Be an encouragement. Because I already know that I'm flawed. I don't need you to poke me at it. I don't need you to tell me. I don't need you to point out to me that I can't spell, like I did yesterday morning. But somehow we get this real thrill that I can correct you. And friends, I would rather be in relationship than be right. I know I'm treading this morning. But you and I are striving to live out our calling and to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. And we need people that will come along and lift our hands up and encourage us and support us, not beat us down. Oh, I might preach about that sometime. Number three, you okay this morning? Yep. You all right? Number three, we can have victory over our enemies. Who are your enemies? Well, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. Friends, I need a church to help me win the battle over these three. I know there are times when many of us Many of you stagger into this building beaten up and discouraged and wounded and confused and the cry of your heart is, does anybody care? Will anybody protect me? Will anybody walk with me? Look at Solomon. Further on in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Do you have two friends? Somebody had the idea yesterday that when I suggested that we get into triads, that that just didn't happen for 100 days. I don't know how that person got the inspiration, but that's exactly what I'm doing. You need a, you need a strand of three. When you have people to live with, when you have experienced the unconditional love of God's people, your cord is not just three strands. If you're in a small group, it may be five to eight strands. If you're in a youth group, it may be 10 or 20 strands. But my friend, the choice is yours. Just like it's a choice to choose Christ and experience salvation, it is a choice to choose to adopt the church family to experience deeper fellowship. But Bob, I've been hurt. I'm sorry. Knowing what I know about imperfect people, I bet you hurt others too. Just saying. Whether it's been intentional or unintentional, we've all hurt people. We don't have no clue. And we've been hurt. Well, Christians should know better. I bet you could have known, you could have known better too. Well, what's the point here? As long as there are churches who are made up of imperfect people, stuff will happen. Bye. And if stuff happens, and it will, I want people who know how to cover the stuff I'm dealing with today. Not by having them rub it in my face, but to reach out with a hand and to give me help and hope and a safe place to rest and recover. And that is a family I want to be a part of. How many of you know adopted children who have who are and have searched to find out who their birth parents were. Many of us would know some. Why do they do that? 
Why do they work towerless hours searching or paying enormous amounts of money to locate their blood relatives? I'll tell you why. They have a longing to belong to someone who thinks and looks and acts just like them. God knew you and I would long for a sense of belonging, and that is why, in his love, in his grace, he created a church family for you to receive it. To fellowship with people who think and look and act just like you. And I love my family, but it's my church family who surrounded me many times and helped me face my darkest days. Do you have that? You see, there are two benefits of being a part of a church. You have a people to share your life with, and you have a purpose to give your life to. You need people to live with. Why? Because when I can, then I can face life's problems. I'm not alone in my faith. I'm not alone in my future. I'm not alone in my failures. I'm not alone in my frustrations. I'm not alone in my fight. I am not alone when I have a church family. And God has given us the church as a spiritual family for our own benefit. Amen? Will you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for creating the church body to be the antidote of today's needs. You desire that following Christ is not just a matter of believing, but it also includes belonging. Father, you gave us people to live with to overcome loneliness. You gave us people to live with to overcome restlessness. And you gave us people to live with to overcome purposelessness. And Holy Spirit, thank you that when we become a part of the family of God here at Parkview, you allow us to enjoy a people to share our life with and a purpose to give our life to. In a world where loneliness and isolation has been magnified with COVID, may you draw us back to be in relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And may we collectively seek your leading, Holy Spirit, to live in and out of our vision of inspiring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Amen.